Good morning. We thank God for this beautiful day he has given us. Today is Sunday, March 22nd, and we thank God for this beautiful Lord's Day. For today is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Although we're laboring under some uh, unusual circumstances, today is still the Lord's Day. And so we come together to worship him in spirit and in truth. I ask that you grab your Bible and turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And as you're turning there, we're mindful of all those that uh, stand in the need of prayer. We're mindful that uh, we're praying for God to heal this country, heal this nation, and heal this world. And until that time, we still trust in God because we know that God is in control and all is out of control. Again, 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, and we will journey there and see what the Lord has to say on today. There the Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, so let the gods, that's little g, do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah and left his servants there. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. Elijah says this, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid himself down again. Concluding at verse number 7, 1 Kings chapter 19. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. Look again, if you will, at verse number 4, 1 Kings chapter 19. There the Bible says, but he himself, speaking of Elijah, went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. I want to talk to you for a few moments from the subject today, when life gives you more than you can handle. When life gives you more than you can handle. In this world that we live in now, life, has seen, life seems to be turned upside down. It almost seems as if though we can't take another day of being 
quarantined and isolated. But yet in the midst of this, God is still in control. And I believe that God has a word for us today as we're dealing with the vicissitudes and the troubles and the struggles of life. And I believe in all my heart that word is coming from 1 Kings chapter 19. God allows us to look at this prophet by the name of Elijah. In the solemn scripture, our attention is seized by the shattered state of God's messenger. This messenger, this valiant and venturous prophet has been victimized by fear. At this point, Elijah, he is but a shadow of the man he had been. He is crouched underneath a juniper tree. Despondency and despair has now set in. His past miracles have been erased from his short-term memory. The luster of his life has faded from view. He is exhausted. The burning flames of his faith have been extinguished by his emotional handicaps. Elijah, his brass bravery has been expunged by the price placed on his head by this woman named Jezebel. He is a man anticipating nothing but anguish. He has plunged to the point of being pathetic. Elijah's broken by fear, and he prays to the God of life to give him death. <clears throat> Hopes have been abandoned. Expectancy has been evacuated. Confidence, his confidence has been crippled. Nothing remains except emptiness, darkness, and despair. Can you relate to Elijah on this morning when life seems to be turned upside down and you expect nothing but emptiness, darkness, and despair? If it's not one thing, it's another. But yet God has a word for us. Even when you feel like life has given you more than you can handle, God says, hold on for just a little while longer. It's hard to believe that this is the same man, Elijah. Is this really Elijah the Tishabite? The man we know who stood boldly and unapologetic before Ahab and promised a drought of both rain and dew. Is this the same Elijah, the man who we know that drank water from the brook and was fed by ravens? Elijah, the man that we know that told the widow of Zarephath to not be afraid. Elijah, the man we know who brought her son back to life. The Elijah, we know who defeated and killed 450 of Baal's prophets. <clears throat> yes, this is the same Elijah, but life has given him more than he can handle. The Elijah we know who called down fire from heaven and consumed 104 men. This is the same Elijah we know who divided the Jordan and walked across on dry ground. The Elijah we know who appeared with Jesus and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. What I'm trying to get you to understand and tell you is that no matter how great you are, there's still times in life where life can deal you such a blow that it almost seems like you can't take anything else. This is the same Elijah where Life has dealt him what we would call a bad hand. Life has given him something that he feels as if though he cannot handle, but God is getting ready to give him a word of encouragement. God is getting ready to minister to him just like God is getting ready to minister to you and I in the midst of our drought, in the midst of our depression, in the midst of our discouragement. God is getting ready to send a healing over this land. God is getting ready to send a blessing into your life. You just need to hold on and and wait until your change comes. Elijah is suffering from the stress and the burden of his ministry. His self-image and self-esteem have been sabotaged. He feels like a failure. He's suffering from an emotional breakdown because he's been carrying the weight of his constituents. He has taken all he can take. He has done everything in his power to turn God's people around. He's been gallant but he has received no gratitude. He's been convincing, but he's received no commendation. He's been truthful, but he's received no thanksgiving. Instead, he's received a death threat from the queen of corruption, Jezebel. Ahab's Phoenician bride and servant of Baal has vowed to pierce him through with the sword as payback for the 450 prophets of Baal slain by Elijah. Elijah was a man with passions like us, according to James chapter 5 and verse number 17. But now Elijah says, I've had enough. Elijah says, it's enough, O Lord. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse number 4, 
He says it's enough. In other words, Elijah is saying, Lord, life has given me more than I can handle. He is now frustrated. <clears throat> he is discouraged. He's tried to encourage others, but now he cannot encourage himself. He was able to help others, but now he cannot even help himself. Elijah has experienced enough. He can't take it anymore. He has reached a breaking point. But before you look down on Elijah, before you talk too bad about Elijah, I want you to understand that some of us are sitting in Elijah's seat on this morning. Some of us are standing in Elijah's place, even ourselves, because we have problems that we cannot solve, stresses that we can't stand, appetites that we can't control, tests we can't tolerate, desires we can't contain, hurts we can't heal, fears we can't fight, evils we can't eradicate, burdens we can't bear, dilemmas we can't denounce, sicknesses we can't overcome, devils we can't defeat, storms we can't settle, rivers we can't cross, debts we can't pay, obstacles we can't overcome, pains we can't appease, gates we can't open, and mountains we can't climb. All of us at some point in time have felt like, God, this is more than I can handle. Sometimes we feel like throwing in the towel and throwing our hands up and saying, Lord, life has given me more than I can handle, and I can't take this anymore. The pressure has pulverized me. I can't take this kind of treatment. I've had enough. I'm trying to do right, but I'm still suffering. I've had enough of running scared. I've had enough. I'm tired of going out full and coming in empty. Have you ever felt that way? You, you, you just feel drained and, and empty. You, you, you try to start your day off full of the spirit of God, full of full of full of excitement, full of joy. But by the time you get to the end of the day, you're just drained. And at some point in time, you, you ask God, what, what, what is this all about? Why do I keep feeling this way? I'm trying to tell you, it is a satanic attack on your mind, your heart, and your spirit. Satan is trying to cause you to walk away from God. But there is some good news in the scripture on this morning that if you hold to God's unchanging hand, everything will be all right. I believe it was Isaiah who said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. you got to have some waiting power and some staying power. And when you learn how to wait on the Lord, he'll give you strength in the midst of your struggles. So Elijah says, I've, I've almost had enough. My fight has faded. My zeal has, have you ever felt like that? My fight has faded. My zeal has gone cold. My determination has dwindled. Elijah is not alone in this spiritual paralysis, for we've all been there. We've all stood in Elijah's seat. Some of you are saying right now, preacher, my fight is almost gone. This virus and the things that are going on in this world, they've turned my world upside down. My children can't go to school. I have job insecurity. My daycare is closed, and I have no gas, no money, no food, no support. I don't, I, I don't think I could take another day of bad news. I try not to watch the news because it's too bad. I turn on the radio, and I hear bad news. I try to read my Bible, but the bad news still plagues my mind. Well, let me help you. Before you sign your declaration of depression, you need to understand what David said in Psalms 34 and verse number 15. And David says this. He says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto his cry. Turn with me real quick to Psalms 34. I, I want to show you that real quick. David, because you need a word of encouragement as we get ready to close. You need a word of encouragement today. Elijah, there were some things that he didn't tap into and didn't understand that if God brought him to defeat Jezebel's prophets, then God would also bring him through the attacks that were on his life. So before, as I said, you sign your declaration of depression, look at what David says in Psalms 34, verse number 15. David says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. What the psalmist is saying is that the eyes of the Lord see everything. 
that God will be your protector. He is the protector of the righteous. And his ears are open to your cry, which means in a time of trouble and danger, God will hear and God will deliver. He gets this assurance from Psalms 34 and verse number 6 where it says, This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his trouble. Some of you are crying right now, but I need to assure you that the Lord hears you and he will save you out of your trouble. The devil can't touch you unless he first of all gets permission from God Almighty. So whatever you're going through, it is ordained by God and God would not bring you to it if he could not carry you through it. And so as we look briefly back at what Elijah, what God does for Elijah, and this is your prescription when life gives you more than you can handle. The first thing God does is he strengthens Elijah. If you look at and read this in your spare time, if you look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 5 through 8, God gives Elijah strength. And when God gives you strength, he gives you strength that you did not have before. In verse 5, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 5, it says, and as he lay and slept under, see, first of all, Elijah is depressed and discouraged because he now has heard that Jezebel is trying to kill him. Elijah, who is this fearless warrior and man of God, goes and sleeps, see, Depression will drain your energy. Depression will drain you of your joy. Depression will drain you so that all you want to do is lay down and sleep. So in verse 5, Elijah, as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. God is getting ready to strengthen Elijah. Verse 6, and he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head, and he did eat and drink and laid down again. Depression caused Elijah to lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat. Here's why. Because the journey is too great for thee. In other words, I am giving you some sustenance because what God has for you to do and what God is wanting you to do, you need to be strengthened in order to do it. And I'm so thankful that God gives us the example in the scripture that the angel didn't just come one time and leave it alone, but the beauty of the text is the angel came the second time so that when Elijah did not get up the first time, the angel did not discard him nor discredit him. He came back a second time, and we ought to all thank God for that second time that he does not give up on us when we don't act right the first time, the second time. I used to ask God for a second chance, but but the older I got, I don't ask God for a second chance. I ask him for another chance. Why? Because I messed up my second chance, my third chance, my fourth chance, my fifth chance, my tenth chance, my twentieth chance. I just ask God for another chance, and I thank him for his grace and for his mercy because he gives it to me even when I messed up. So the first point is God strengthened Elijah. He gave him something to strengthen him because the journey was going to be too long. God strengthened Elijah, and he went 40 days and 40 nights with God's supply. Then next, not only did he strengthen Elijah, but he searched him. See, God will put you in a position, and he'll search you. But he won't search you because he doesn't know you but he'll search you to teach you some things about yourself. During this time of, of, of crisis and pandemic that we're in, you should have learned some things about you. I, I know you've learned some things about other people, but you ought to use this to learn some things about your and grow internally. If this has shown us nothing else, God has put us in a timeout period 
where we can sit down, meditate, and focus upon him. Because some have said previously, I don't have time for this, that, and the other. And some have even indicated that they didn't have time for God. And so what God said is and says is what I'll do is I'll cause you to sit down where you can't go anywhere because I want you to really see if you have time for me. So God, after he strengthened Elijah, he searched him. If you look at verses 9 through 14, I don't have time to deal with all this. On two occasions, God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah had ran into a cave hiding. God did not bring you out of what he brought you out of for you to go hide in a cave. God, you have to remember how good God has been to you. See, too many of us are, are judging and basing the goodness of God in this moment where we have forgotten about all the times that God has been good to us. And if you count, as Big Mama would say, your good days outweigh your bad days. And since your good days outweigh your bad days, you ought not complain. We should just trust God. Twice, God asked Elijah, what are you doing here? Verses 9 through 14. Verse number 9, and he came unto a cave and lodged there. That's Elijah. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What dost thou hear? Doest thou hear? In other words, Elijah, why are you here? If God has blessed you, he does not bless you to go hide in a cave. God did not give you the victory for you to go hide in a cave. God gave you the victory because when the next time a challenge comes around, you can remember the victory that you had before. And then finally, after God searched him, he sent him. God strengthened him. God searched him. Elijah, now God is getting ready to send him. Now, let's take Elijah out of it. God has strengthened you. Even if you don't feel it, God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. He has not only strengthened us, he has searched us. In other words, why are you acting the way you acted? Why are you in that cave of depression I'm God. I have not forgotten about you. You are still covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. God wants to know why are you where you are? We ought to have joy even in the midst of trials, even in the midst of tribulation, even in the midst of storm. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. And then God sends Elijah. Verses 15 through 18, I'll read it and the message will be yours. And the Lord said unto him, go and return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. God is telling Elijah, I've given you everything you need and now it's time for you to go. I know I'm talking to somebody on this morning where it seems like life has given you more than you can handle. But God is giving you everything that you need. And I'm so glad that God is telling us to go. God has, never, God has not told us to stop doing his will. God has told us to sit in place, but we can still do the will of God. I'm glad that God is still in the sending business, for he sent Elijah on a new mission. He sent Abraham, Ab Abraham out of his country to a land that he would show him. He sent Moses back to Egypt. He sent Joshua into the land of promise. He sent Gideon into Midian. He sent Samuel as a prophet. He sent David as a king. He sent Jonah to Nineveh. He sent Isaiah as a prophet. He sent John to make the way straight for the Lord. And he sent Jesus to take away the sins of the world. And God is getting ready to do a great thing in our life because when we come out of this, we need to understand that God is sending us to do an even greater work. 
So the message is yours today. I know that some of you feel as if though right now life has given me more than I can handle. But God is right where God has always been. Someone asked me the other day, why would God allow something like this to happen? Listen, don't you ever doubt God because of the troubles of this world. God is still sitting high and looking low. And there's nothing that can happen nor take place. And we don't minimize anything that has happened, but there's nothing that has happened, is happening, or will happen outside of the mind and the will of God. We just must trust God. So some of you need prayer on today. Because you're uncertain about some things. You don't know what's going to happen, what the next move is. You ought to just trust God. Our government is trying to figure it out, but there's another council in heaven, and we need to trust in that council. Some of you who are watching today through live stream and throughout the World Wide Web, you need Jesus. This is just a wake-up call that God is still in control. You need to come to Jesus just as you are. You come by hearing the word of God, believing what you've heard. Be willing to repent of your sins and confess Jesus Christ to be the son of God. And we will baptize you for the remission of your sins. And when this happens, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit serves as a guide, serves as a comforter. We walk with him. He leads us into truth and righteousness. And if you are a child of God today and you just need prayer, you call in, you send a text, you email, or you pray right where you are, ask somebody to pray for you. Because you don't need to walk through these dangerous times without being on the right side of the Lord. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. The Simpson Street Church of Christ here in Atlanta, we're here for you. Because we understand that God has created us for a time such as this. And we as God people, we cannot run nor retreat, but we must stand four square on the firmly on the word of God and declare that we serve a God who is able. May God bless you and may he bless you extremely well. We've now come to a point in time in our service where it's time to give our offering to the Lord. Although the world has, in essence, shut down, the church itself can never shut down because the church is not the building. The church is the people. However, the building and the functioning of the building must carry on. And so God has blessed us with incomes and means of providing and the first thing that we must understand is that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to the Lord. God asks us, he commands us to participate in his economy of blessings. Malachi asked a question a long time ago, will a man rob God? First, First Chronicles 29 and 9 says, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap with the measure that you use. We have to give because we participate in God's economy of blessings. If God has blessed us, we are to give. The business of the building, the organization, does not stop. 
And so we ask that you give. You can text your giving in. You can give by PayPal. You can give by Cash App. Um, you can give online or you can mail it in. And that information is now on the screen. May God bless you and may he bless you extremely well. Shall we pray for the offering? Father, we thank you so much for this day. You are the greatest example of a giver. Everything you have created gives. And God, we are no different because we're your greatest creation. And so God, we give not out of guilt. We give not out of compulsion, but we give because of your grace and your mercy. We give because we thank you and we love you. And now we ask that you accept this offering as a sweet smelling savor into your nostrils that we have given you the first fruits of our labor and that it may be used for the uplifting and upbuilding of the kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We have now come to an item of worship that we call communion, where we come around the table to commemorate and remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We look at examples that have been given to us throughout Scripture. We do this every Lord's Day as we come together and assemble around the table. Acts chapter 20 and verse number seven. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. We also find examples in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 23. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 20, beginning at verse number 23. The Bible says, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he shall come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh of damnation unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You may now partake of the bread and the cup to remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for joining us in our virtual worship service. Today is the day that the Lord hath made, and we ask that you continue to rejoice in this day. We don't know how long this will last, but God knows. Our responsibility is to worship God in spirit and in truth. Make it a great day because God is great and God has been good to you. We thank you for joining us here at the Simpson Street Church of Christ, and we pray that when all of this is over, you will come to this building and worship with us, not virtually, but practically. May God bless you on this day as we close in a word of prayer. Father, again, we thank you for this worship service. We thank you for life, health and strength. Fathers, we're dealing with this pandemic. We just know that Jesus is the answer. 
God, he was bruised for our benefit. He was shamed for our salvation. He was pierced for our preservation. He was wounded for our iniquities. So, God, right now we plead the blood of Jesus over this world, over this country, and over this community. Touch us with a hand of healing as only you can, that we may go about our daily activities. But, God, let the new normal be that we will lift our heads unto the hills from which cometh our help and our strength, knowing that it comes from the Lord. Let our new normal be, God, that we will spend time with our family, our friends, and our loved ones. More importantly, God, that we will spend time with you. Let our new normal be, God, that we so yearn to come back into this building that when the doors are open, that people will flood back just to find a place in the sanctuary of God. Now, Father, bless us, be with us, forgive us, guide us, and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living at this moment because of you. And I want to thank you and praise you too. Your grace and mercy brought me through. Your grace, Your grace and mercy, Your grace and mercy. Grace and mercy, grace and mercy, grace and mercy.